Hey, welcome to Bleeding Edge Interviews. I am your host, Supa Dave. Thank you so much for joining me on another deep dive into the mind of one of the artists out there making the wonderful progressive rock we get to listen to. Now, Tim Boness is a name you're probably familiar with, not just for his solo work, but also for his work with Stephen Wilson on their No Man project. And in addition to that, he is actively working with various artists of diverse styles in collaborations on their albums and otherwise. But the fact that he has time to put out solo records as prolifically as he does is pretty amazing. Now, his latest album, Powder Dry, is out now, and it represents a very significant departure from his previous solo albums in many ways. Now, I'm going to let him tell you all about that. So let's get into my chat with Tim Boness. Good afternoon to you. I hope you're doing well. Indeed, yeah. It's a very gloomy afternoon here. I I can imagine. I know the UK's got that <laughs> reputation, but as many times as I've been there, I've usually had rather good weather unless I'm in the Northeast, which lives up to the rep up there. <laughs> that is true. I've been to the Northeast a few times and the sky does seem different. Yeah. Um, I'm in the Southwest, which is normally very bright, but um, we've had about a week of rain. And I think yeah. in one of the days it was... Um, a month's rain in a few hours so it's pretty extreme yeah i i had i had seen that taken note of that i was going to ask you i hope you're doing well and not in one of those desperately flooded areas but it sounds well, like you're at least close i'm pretty close because we have um a river but luckily i'm on a hillside overlooking the river there you go so there you go safety <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do it be on a hill so excellent well i'm glad you're doing well and uh thank you very much for joining me i appreciate your time i'm glad we were able to work this out yeah indeed. my pleasure so uh, you've got a few things going on as one might uh figure in your line of work but of course the big thing going on right now is powder dry it has been out for a couple of weeks a month I know I've seen multiple dates for the release, so I wasn't sure which one. <laughs> yeah, was it, was, it was actually, uh, I think it was, it was released officially on September 13th, so yeah. not quite a week. But um, I think it was accidentally released in the Netherlands about two weeks earlier <laughs> and, and so on. But um, but yeah, so about six days anyway. Fair enough. Okay. I, I wanted to check. I frequently find these days I have to do memory slash sanity checks with other people to see if it's me or if it's reality that's messing around. So fortunately, yeah, yeah. In case it's reality. So the album's out and seems to be getting a really uh, positive response from critics. And it's, it's an interesting and notable album for you. Uh, first and foremost, the fact that it's uh, you've switched from Inside Out to K-Scope. Mm -hmm. So it's your first album uh, in this quote unquote new beginning with a new label. Um, but it's also unique in the, in the fact that it's the first album where basically it is all you self-produced yeah. self-played like every, every instrument and everything on there is you uh, probably the biggest hand uh, outside of yourself is, is Stephen Wilson helping out with uh, production and such and mixing. Um, what, inspired you to take this path on this go-round after all these years? Well, I've always written uh, complete songs and also ever since I had home studio um, about 20 years ago, have always given complete pieces to my No Man projects, obviously my solo projects and so on. And while some of my instruments and my arrangements are maintained, often my parts are played by better musicians on the actual recording. So I've tended to work with musicians who are better than I am. And also because, you know, it can be fantastic to get that sense of surprise that you may have written something, but another musician takes it into another territory, another dimension that is quite pleasing. Um, this time around, it was because after Butterfly Mind, which really felt like a new start in some ways, I didn't write very much for about 14 months. I think there were four to six co-writes with people and they were perfectly fine, but they didn't seem to me to be fresh. And when I was discussing this with the person I've co-produced my last few albums with, Brian Hulse, he said, well, I feel that I only make your demos more musical. I don't necessarily make them better. And said, why don't you for the first time do something entirely on your own. And 
as soon as he said that, something snapped and the music just flowed. It was an incredible experience of I decided I was going to do this myself. And suddenly the melodies, the ideas, the diversity of approaches, everything I wanted to do was happening in the music. And so after 14 months of very cautious and very few co-writes, music was flowing out. And I wrote this in three batches of about 10 songs each, where I just became absolutely preoccupied with the process. And, and when I'd started, Stephen Wilson had said, brilliant, this is what you should have done years ago. And, and Peter Hamill, who has become a friend and was somebody whose work I adored when I was a, a, a teenager, he said, yep, yeah, this is exactly what you should be doing and, and gave me one of his Van de Graaff generator pedal boards to help me. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, very good. It's, it's kind of amazing, I guess. The idea of a new perspective, a new path seemed to just be the gateway to inspiration that you were having trouble finding before. And, and it was there all the time in some ways, yeah. yeah. And uh, But I think as soon as I committed to it, um, it was very instinctive. And I think that a lot of the album, because it, it's extremely diverse in terms of the styles uh, it approaches, probably more so than mm -hmm. any other album I've released, but none of that was contrived. It really was, how am I feeling on any given day? And I start to write and this is what appears. And often I was quite shocked by the directions of th that some of the songs took. Yeah, it, and, and I note that uh, Stephen himself was quoted in the press release, you know, talking about the idea that uh, I think he quoted it as your, one of your most creative albums. And yeah. I wasn't sure if that meant diverse or not, but that's the way I took it. And agreed, you know, listening to that, there are uh, bits of influences and styles that are uh, maybe weren't necessarily not present before, but are more prominent this time around and assert themselves a good bit more. And that was interesting. So, you know, I was curious if that was in some way, hey, let me expand my palette a little bit, or if it just happened the way it happened. Because I know for a lot of musicians, it is the inspiration is what it is. It's not something that they go into intentionally. Yeah, this wasn't intentional. This was a sense of having a feeling, trying to capture that feeling, and then trying to make the music that resulted from that as good as it can be. So the finessing of things from the production side or from my re-singing or writing lyrics, that would take quite some time but the initial inspiration was almost automatic um and it was great because it, it really felt like it was an inspirational flow that i was then getting some energy from and that fed into the melodies and the lyrics and the finessing of the production that i was responsible for and it, it was it was very exciting rather than it being a chore actually and i suppose it was quite liberating in the sense that i think that along with Stephen, I've probably got more eclectic interests than a lot of the musicians I, I deal with. So some of the musicians I work with are superb musicians, but they're brilliant in a few territories. And that's because that's the music they love and it's the music they want to make. It's not that they're not fulfilling their potential because actually they can't stand this territory that might be <laughs> of interest to me. Yeah. And that was one of the more liberating elements that even though with my solo albums previously, of course, I did the co-production and of course I was responsible for artwork and the sequencing and the direction of the album. Um, there'd always be the occasional debate this time there was no debate. There were no arguments. But, you know, then again, no man sessions were, were always that as well. You know, myself and Stephen, yeah. it really is a case of just throwing ideas down and seeing what emerges and then making what emerges as good as it can be. Looking back at this, do, do you think there was anything in particular 
that might have been fueling that inspiration, you know, uh, music you'd recently discovered or rediscovered. I know it's interesting to me in, in listening to the most recent episode of the album years that a lot of the music heard on the album um, sort of brings one back to the early 80s, uh, mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s era. And interestingly enough, you guys put out the most recent episode focused on 1982. And I yeah. think in some way uh, ended up talking about a lot of those influences we're hearing on the new album. And I thought, wow, what amazing planning. I mean, people have said this, whether <laughs> the album years in some ways has influenced the album because it reflects the broad nature of our tastes. And obviously we're listening to the music as we're you know before we do the the podcast and i don't know i mean that period late 70s probably to early 80s was was very important to me i mean i was just becoming fascinated by music i was a teenager and this was when albums that were released during that time were a revelation to me so while i had an interest in music of the 60s, 70s, even the 50s when I was growing up. It wasn't something I'd experienced firsthand. So my my mind might have been blown by Dark Side of the Moon or by Close to the Edge, but these were albums that I discovered quite a few years after they were made. Whereas when albums like The Dreaming and Peter Gabriel 3 and 4 came out, I was not only open to them, but they were happening in that present time and expanding my idea of what music could be. So I think that a lot of that kind of, if you like, genuinely new progressive music and also the, the post-punk music that was happening at the time was, um, was opening my my tastes and my outlooks to, to new sounds and, and it's quite conceivable that left to my own devices mm -hmm. subconsciously these things that absolutely change my view of what music could be still appear on my music because there's one song called the ghost of a kiss mm -hmm. and the working title for that was the barb and this is because i felt i had accidentally accessed something of early Richard Barbieri and his work with Japan. And it wasn't something I'd intended to do. This was the sound that came out and I really quite liked this. I developed the piece. And again, you know, Japan during that period were, were a band I absolutely adored. And at least one of the tracks in some ways has an aspect of that. Obviously I hope that I do what I do differently. Um, it's not any kind of, of replica of what went before. And, and technology changes and my voice changes. Yeah. And another thing I'd say, other than the album years, was possibly that one of the things I often do to kickstart creativity is go over old material I've written that was never completed or was never completed to my satisfaction. And during the making of this album, or maybe even just before it, Stephen and I were going through Early No Man for the housekeeping box set and for the Swagger album that we released. And so I was being reintroduced to things I'd not heard for a very long time. Mm. And as happens, you think, my God, why did I do that? But then also you think, my God, why don't I do that now? There, there are certain things that you've forgotten that you did. You've forgotten that were part of you. And I'm sure that being reconnected with the early no man as well triggered something right. in me in in the quest and and i've continued to work with brian hulse and and plenty which was my pre no man band and again i sometimes hear things in that where i think okay what i'm doing is missing that and perhaps there is an aspect sometimes of even bringing back elements of my former self into my present music that's interesting because it, it puts me in mind of those occasions where you are introduced to music, you know, one one discovers an album or whatever, gives it a listen and kind of walks away the first time going, eh, mm -hmm. and then maybe listens again later and goes, eh, still eh, and then somehow or other at a later date re-listens to it and suddenly goes, oh, 
wow, I really like this. Why didn't I like this before? I had never conceived of that as being something people could do with their own work as well as somebody else's. Yeah, I mean, I think you always have an idea when something is right and when something isn't right. When something isn't right, it goes on into that sort of hard drive of doom. And <laughs> it's great sometimes when you listen to something 10 years afterwards and think, okay, now I can hear the seeds of the song and where it can go. I can, and perhaps you've also developed the skills to take it further that you didn't have at the time when you wrote it. Or just the inspiration. You know, sometimes inspiration runs out. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So it's, uh, it's interesting to note uh, one of the other notable differences this time around um, is uh, a penchant more towards brevity. Um, much mm -hmm. shorter songs than you have typically done on most of your albums. Not that you never did shorter songs in the albums, but I, I was, again, in the press release, struck by the uh, the phrasing of trying to capture the ever-elusive nowness of now, which <laughs> yeah. then in, in my you know stream of consciousness flowed into the concept of fleeting moments. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, okay, that almost seems to mesh with the idea of these songs being shorter, almost of a purpose. The idea that uh, you know, so much of life is fleeting moments and things are brief. Yeah. Um, and I thought, wow, I wonder in, in, in my brain that tends to overanalyze anything, Prague, <laughs> I start attributing meaning to things that have no actual intent. But it also made me think, gee, I wonder if if there was also something of a, an intent on your part to, similar to what Rush did in the late 70s, early 80s, particularly around permanent waves, challenging themselves uh, towards writing uh, more concise compositions. So I was curious if that had anything to do with this. I think that I just followed what I felt the songs were going to be. And, and some of the songs, there were longer versions, not much longer versions, but I'd edited them to how it felt to me. So for me, I remember hearing the song of Prog Ian Anderson, I think, saying that he felt that progressive music or creative music, generally speaking, that, that was being produced, he partly did what he did because he got bored very easily. And he assumes that the listeners also got bored. This is why there were so many shifts lyrically and musically. And there may be an element of creative ADHD, which I'm sure a band like Rush also suffers from because they can't stay in one place, yeah. which is one of the things that I most admire them for. I mean, I, I particularly liked it actually when in the late 70s, early 80s, they somehow, managed to focus themselves into shorter pieces that had all of the invention and adventure of the earlier work and perhaps an added maturity. So certainly while I wasn't conscious of doing that, I can see it in other people's work, how they did that. I mean, of course I was challenging myself to a degree in the sense that I was playing the guitar parts. And generally speaking, what I can do well on the guitar are, arpeggiated folk pieces and almost singer-songwriter strumming. This is something that I just do naturally. It comes to me. I can also do, um, if push, push comes to shove, um, time signature explosive riffs, almost as a kind of a joke they come out. But that comes more from my love of Steve Reich and Philip Glass and a lot of the minimalist composers, where it's just something that my mind is drawn to and I end up playing bits on guitar. But yeah, so there were challenges of how am I going to play this on guitar? I know I need to do something. And then getting that sound that you need. And it was just very exciting to get to that point. I thought, oh, OK, I can do this or I can do this. And it was easier than I thought it was going to be or all sorts of, of things that that emerged. I think the only time I sort of challenged myself to a certain extent was with some of the tempos that what I didn't want was that kind of sluggish mid-tempo that I think a lot of albums can drown in. Mm. And, I, and I love that sometimes. Obviously, there are certain bands, you know, whether it's Flaming Lips or Pink Floyd, that can make these wonderful washes, mid-paced albums that are brilliant. Um, but it wasn't something I wanted to do. I wanted to challenge perhaps what my natural instinct would be for tempo so i was almost starting at certain points right i, think, I, I think, wouldn't 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I think one of the things that, that benefits us as the listeners for this is, too, is briefer, more concise uh, compositions then also allow more opportunity for greater diversity. Mm. And that's obviously in evidence in evidence on this album as well, is that there are a lot of stylistic and, as you mentioned, tempo variations and, and um, just different ideas that we get probably more of than if the songs and the compositions were longer. Uh, yeah. It's comparable in my mind to when I suddenly realized all those Beatles songs that are so well known and so great, like so many of them are so surprisingly short it's like uh, i felt like yeah. they fit so much into a very short song that it didn't seem like wait that was only two and a half minutes <laughs> yeah, yeah indeed well, i think i've got my beatles love songs compilation and that's got about 18 pieces over two sides of vinyl so yeah very very short having said that i think there's a lot of music on that actually is it 40 it might even be 40 pieces on that it was, it was astonishing um yes i think you're right i think it did allow for more ideas and i think it allowed for more ideas to be fulfilled as well and what happens during the album as well there are a couple of times when i do recall lyrical ideas from songs so a, a few of the songs some of the lyrical ideas are spread across maybe two or three same with musical ideas that are used on a couple of tracks and so on so there's a sense of continuity i mean i wrote about 30 songs for it which i whittled down to 16 and one of the most arduous tasks was making this into the album is because for me although these are individual tracks i wanted it to be a cohesive album that had dynamic arcs throughout it so it's important to me that it works as this 40 minute cohesive album that doesn't get boring at any any point and this meant me dropping as i said about 14 pieces and some of them were longer pieces and some of them were pieces also that echoed others and i thought okay i've already said the idea here it doesn't need to be said twice but then on another occasion it could be okay that idea is used in this piece it's a nice brief echo and it gives a sense of continuity and flow so yeah that was the for perhaps the most time consuming element was the um construction of the 40 minutes the album sequencing which i've always been obsessed with and i always think in terms of album flow and statement flow even if the individual songs of course are important and distinct from one another yeah yeah that's something i appreciate um in how people construct their albums and in particular how they put together the songs because i recognize that there are a lot of artists out there that as you do, as you just did, you know, they've composed much more than they need for the album or than they want. And maybe they discard some ideas, but the idea that you can hear within them, the continuity, they are of a time and perhaps, you know, of a certain mindset or emotional point in when they were created. And yet at the same time are individualized and diverse enough that it doesn't sound like it's variations of the same song over and over yeah absolutely I and mean, i think in terms of mood what was interesting is that you know one day something beautiful would occur the next day something quite rhythmic and propulsive and the day after something utterly hideous and dismal <laughs> and it was very much responding to what the feeling was and and i think you know make perhaps another influence behind the eclecticism is that we live in this time of 24-hour news culture and we live in an historically turbulent period as well and i'm sure that quite a lot of the things that we're all bombarded with on a day-to-day -day basis whether it is israel gaza ukraine russia environmental catastrophe potentially destroying us that i'm sure that this also filtered its way into some of the music and and some of the moods yeah that's amazing you did an excellent job right there basically anticipating my next question <laughs> is that that reading through and and understanding um as best i could um absorb it all but just the the subject matter within the lyrics definitely give the impression of someone who is 
you know, going through and watching the news of the day or heaven forbid, I say reading a newspaper. Do they still have those anymore? <laughs> they uh, do. And, yeah. <laughs> and still wrestling with all of that stream of pervasive strife in the world. Mm. And, you know, it kind of sounds like that it maybe matches your experience in creating it. I, I don't know if this is in and of itself is a, a variation on the, the idea of journaling as a coping skill. It can be, yeah. I think that music generally, just the sensation of music has always been a brilliant distraction from the ills of the world. Um, and so bringing the ills of the world to the music, I'm not quite sure how that works. But yes, it perhaps is a means of coping with the overflow of information. And I think I go through periods with my music of reflecting that outside world and then perhaps just wanting to lose myself in absolute beauty absolute music um or personal emotion you know there are no man albums like together with stranger which is purely based on personal relationships and that can be personal relationships romantically and with death and in other means but it's a very introspective album late night laments was similarly introspective and i think that this is it my music does go through periods of welcoming in ideas from the outer world or filtering ideas from the outer world or blocking them out and trying to just lose myself in sound. Yeah. I, I've usually experienced your music as, as generally rather personal, rather introspective. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you'd agree. It seemed to me this one was uh, much more socially oriented, I guess, uh, more of the time. Um, how does that differ for you in terms of reflecting what you see versus sharing, you know, your internal experiences. I imagine there's a kind of vulnerability with both of them, depending on what's going on. But I, I imagine you're probably used to that by now. Yeah, there is. I mean, the thing is that ultimately you just follow what is interesting to you at any given time and it becomes all encompassing and quite passionate. So the thing that's interesting to me is that I can sing a very vulnerable personal song and be emotional, but equally I can sing something about what's happening in the wider world and be emotional. And when I did the album Lost in the Ghost Light, which was a concept album about a character who wasn't me and who had experienced things I'd not experienced, I was as lost in the emotions of that character, almost as if you're writing a novel, as I am when I'm singing a personal song. So that's the thing that does um, interest me, that, that whatever the subject matter and wherever it's coming from, it seems to be all encompassing and all absorbing. Wow. Yeah. And it, it musically and lyrically, I guess there's this, at times, under undercurrent of anger um, or frustration um, or panic. I mean, they're kind of all <laughs> two uh, sides of the same coin, so to speak, if we can talk in terms of three-sided coins, which I just created. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it sounds like, I, I guess my perspective, that's not always been your primary go-to. Did Was there a certain sense of uh, extra discordance within yourself as you were writing some of the stuff, you think? Difficult to know. I mean, I yeah. think that always you write because, in a sense, there is still a void in you that needs to be filled. So there's still that void, yeah. which is why I continue to write. And yeah, I agree. I think it was more extrovert and it was angrier. And I think that when I first started, before I ever got signed, before I ever worked with Stephen Wilson, my work was angrier as well. And that was an, an angrier, more divisive political time. So perhaps there is a sense that even subconsciously I'm responding to the divisiveness outside of me and it's influencing what I'm doing. But yeah, I agree with you. I think that there is definitely a more extrovert quality and there is definitely an angrier quality. And the title Powder Dry, it comes from the old fashioned saying of keep your powder dry. In other words, don't explode. And I think that with the songs there is this sense of almost trying to keep a balance in a chaotic world yeah yeah and and it's 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 hard to imagine anybody uh in your line of work at this point in time who at least 
pays even a minimal amount of attention to everything that's going on to not mm -hmm. at some point in time reflect that outwardly in their in their art uh, it's it's <laughs> as the chinese saying supposedly the chinese saying mm -hmm. i think there's some doubt about whether that was it you know may you live in interesting times wow oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah they've been quite interesting so it's it's it nice makes for interesting me. music in many ways as well <laughs> I think it does. And I think the art has genuinely responded. And what was interesting, I think, for quite a number of years, there wasn't very much political music or very much angry music. Mm -hmm. um, and there does seem to be a return in some artists to something more intense, for sure. Yeah. And... I don't know whether you put yourself in that category, uh, if whether you like labels of Prague or not, but I know certainly it, it's it's bubbling up a little bit, I think, in some ways, in terms of people mm -hmm. reflecting their experience of our world. Um, I, I know talking with Andy Tillerson, he was yeah. saying, you know, he tends to go against the grain a little bit or always has seen himself as going against the grain in terms of writing very politically and socially oriented lyrics uh, to Prague, which has oftentimes been associated with more esoteric types sure. of things. But uh, clearly, he's not the only one. No, no. And, uh, you know, I, I, no, Andy, I've met him a few times. And um, I think that is one of his signatures. I think from the very, very beginning, his lyrics have been quite different from most of progressive lyrics. And, and I'm not sure whether I do count myself as that. I mean, certainly progressive music when I was growing up was, was a massive influence, but I always had very diverse tastes as I think the album years shows. Mm -hmm. And when No Man was signed, we were actually signed on the back of bands like Happy Mondays and Stone Roses, the kind of Manchester indie dance scene. We weren't that either. But, you know, we'd, I, I think during the 80s, the artists that we'd adored, people like Kate Bush, David Sylvian, Talk Talk, Blue Nile, Dead Can Dance, they were producing quite expansive music, which I would say almost was a continuation of the experiments of progressive post-punk to an extent was a continuation of the experiments of progressive. I think that progressive music shifts or should shift in every era. But, um, but you know, that doesn't mean that I don't love, as I said, Dark Side of the Moon, Close to the Edge. I adored them when I was younger, still adore them. Um, but lyrically, I think my work was, was certainly very, very far from what people perceive as being progressive lyrics and, and as Andy's are, which is, of course, that sword and sorcery fantasy element. I was never particularly interested. I think that when I... I, I mean, I read a lot when I was growing up as well and, and watched a lot of films, but I was very interested in sort of kitchen sink drama, quite gritty social realism. But equally, I was very attracted to science fiction dystopia. So things like THX 1138 or 1984, these were big things for me as well. So I, I kind of had sci-fi dystopia and then gritty realism and then occasionally... Um, Almost, I suppose the the furthest I get away from that is a lush romanticism that I'm also attracted to, a kind of idealistic romanticism, which I think we had in No Man. And I kind of refer to that as being the retreat into beauty approach. Yeah. And, and certainly uh, cathartic, not just for yourselves, but for those of us that get to listen to it as well and to get away from those cares of the world. Yeah. Um, and, and you've, mentioning the podcast as i was listening that like i said that latest episode i was i was kind of uh, pleased and happy to hear somebody mention rupert hine not as a producer but as an artist because he rarely seems to get that much attention um yeah outside of you know probably he it's it's one of those ones the musicians and the artists know but for whatever reason the general public didn't seem to quite catch on to the same degree but it you'll hear that name talked about in in other areas and he was yeah. Uh, yeah. definitely responsible for producing some of my my favorite albums back in the uh, in the 80s when he was active mostly he was uh, he was an interesting man when i met him a few times because he lived quite near me and um i know his widow now and I discovered his music at the time. And I think it was partly because 
a review, a tiny review in the British music papers had compared it to Peter Gabriel's three and four. And I thought, okay, I'm in, you know, and I bought this, I saw an interview with him and I didn't know his production work. I just knew Immunity and Waving Not Drowning that were the albums then, and oh. then The Wildest Wish to Fly. And I was blown away with them. I thought they were incredibly creative albums and very, very few people knew about them. And I think I introduced Stephen Wilson to them and I introduced a few friends to them. And I believe that they had been quite successful in Scandinavia, so Sweden, okay. Norway, but not in Britain, his, his home country. And um, as I said, luckily, you know, I got, I got to meet him um, a few times and he was you know very interesting man and of course over the years I got to know what his productions were mm -hmm. and a point that you make is that musicians were listening so let's say I was listening and obviously then Stephen was listening in the early days of No Man mm -hmm. and interestingly enough um, it turns out that Rush had heard and loved Immunity and Waving Not Drowning that's why they got him to produce the Rush albums. Kate Bush was also a massive fan of Immunity. And I think Stephen W. Taylor, who co-produced the albums with Rupert, he is now Kate's main engineer. So they definitely had an impact on musicians and not just any musicians, you know, people like Rush and Kate Bush who have massive followings and so on, they were clearly listening. Yeah. Yeah, he he was definitely one of the hot producers at the time, and it, yeah. it, it surprised me the day I happened to notice in a bargain bin a, a cassette that said Rupert Hine. I went, "What? Well, wait a minute, <laughs> he does albums too. <laughs> he mm. makes his own. Okay." And yeah, that happened to be "Wildest Wish to Fly," which I quite enjoyed. Yeah. And and in some ways, I think there are parts of Powder Dry that that put me in mind of that a little bit. Uh, that influence okay. there with the comparatively sparse arrangements and. Uh, vocal stylings and things like that. So I'm. That he like has a certain intensity. There. I think. Yeah, yeah, he has an intensity that. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, he was somebody I, whose work I really liked, and you know, as we say, he was one of those artists that virtually no one seemed to to acknowledge, and it, it was strange. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, having now gone through the process uh, for the first time, when you first envisioned doing this album basically by yourself mm -hmm. and i presume like most of us would you develop some expectations in your head of what that was going to be like in retrospect how did the actual experience of it compare to your expectations going in it was more exciting i think there's just a real sense of relief so the process of it there was just real enthusiasm using the studio as the toy box or the paint box and I just remember that feeling of getting carried away with what was being done. So the whole process was really quite joyful. Mm. Um, and then once I'd done it, and once I'd certainly created the album in the way that, uh, that I wanted it to be, um, yeah, I, I, I was satisfied and I had a real sense of relief that I'd managed to pull it off. And certainly the responses from the record company and from audience and reviews were incredibly positive because you know I'm used to working with exceptional musicians and I'm used to working with other people who you know if not make the decisions they certainly contribute um, strongly to the music so so yeah it, it was um, a great relief and, and very fulfilling to do but the interesting thing is I've got a few outtakes I'm going to develop more fully with my band mm. and um, I've also developed a few more pieces since then but because this album felt fresh, spontaneous, diverse, I don't want to make an, a follow-up in the same way again for some time. Yeah. You know, at the moment, I've been writing more intricate, intricate guitar pieces that are less eclectic, really. Um, but I don't know where they're going because I've not developed them into songs. And I've been doing some things with my live band which is perhaps where it will be going. I think that I kind of feel after doing something that was just me, I want to do something that is on a different scale with the same band throughout all of the tracks. So there's a there's a unity uh, with that. And we're going to hopefully start working on something 
um, in October and November. Oh, wow. And outside of that, I've been working on re-recordings again of some early Plenty material, which has been nice because it's fantastic when you listen to a song that's 35 years old and you think, now I can sing it properly or, okay, just twisting the lyric a little bit makes it so much better for me. So that's been very enjoyable as well. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, so sounds like for those of us that go, great, we want to hear him do it solo again. The answer is yes, just not next. So I think we can all be happy. I think so, yeah. I mean, definitely I'm going to develop some of the ideas that I have, yeah. uh, some of the outtakes. And I've also been rediscovering, because as I said, I've kind of created demos uh, for my work ever since I set up my home studio about 20 years ago, including quite a lot that I'd given to No Man. And those I've been going through, taking the files and developing them that little bit further. So there's certainly an album's worth of purely solo material that I could release. Mm -hmm. But I think that I should let this linger and let it have its place in the world, because I think that every album, you know, we live in such a crowded universe of music with streaming, you know, hundreds of thousands of things released during any given year that I feel that if you put something out into the world, you've got to feel that it deserves to exist, really, rather than just throwing something out there for the sake of it. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, uh, it's, it is a lot to keep up with. Uh, <laughs> for those of us listening, uh, with so much coming out. So we appreciate that space, at least if I can speak on behalf of the world. Yeah. <laughs> you can like do so. speak on behalf of the world <laughs> I've, I've just taken on that role yeah. um so and that answers kind of you know I, what was going to be my final question really is is what do you have in the works now i know you're slated to uh, headline Prague the forest later mm -hmm. this year uh, a little um uh, uh, an event that i became familiar with in talking with the guys that uh Hats off, gentlemen, it's adequate. And so that's very cool to see you playing with them. Uh, any yeah. other uh, plans for live performances? Because I know you've been enjoying working uh, in that kind of uh, uh, modality with uh, Butterfly Mind. It's what well, it's really transformed it. It's been a great experience because, as you know, probably Butterfly Mind consists of myself, Matt Stevens from Fierce and the Dead on guitar, the rhythm section of Andy Edwards and John. Jowett, who've been in IQ, Frost, and lots of other bands, and Rob Groker. And um, it's been perhaps the best live band I've ever worked with because they just have this great ability to serve the music, but also to fly off at tangents. So it's been, in some ways, the opposite of the album, which is very condensed, which um, has brevity as one of its main strengths. The live band can just fly off at various tangents and it's been great fun and really quite enjoyable for all of us i think so yeah that is is definitely one of the things we'll be doing and we'll be playing at the prog the forest we've also been offered um, a festival in germany that we'll be playing i think in april and we are being offered quite a number of dates but we've not confirmed them yet so at the moment the only confirmed dates are the festival in London in December and a festival in Germany in April. And hopefully we'll get a few more offers because we, we really are kind of enjoying playing together. And what's great is that no one gig is the same. The songs sound different every time, which is how it does fit in with um, Powder Dry and that it's capturing a moment each time. Very cool. Very nice. Uh, it just, this reminds me that I've, We've we've got to move to Europe somewhere because all the great festivals are there and the US doesn't have enough of them. But if I know if I know one thing, when I move there, it's gonna be on a hill. <laughs> Most definitely, because obviously what will be happening is this hill will become an island soon. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And That's then cool. no man is an island. Exactly. I'll I'll be getting the grocery deliveries by boat. There you go. How cool would that be? Yeah. Well, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I, I really appreciate uh, all your insights and, and such, and the, you giving me the time to, to chat about the new album, which uh, I hope enjoys continued success. You know, it certainly is is one of the better albums I've heard this year. It certainly is is remarkable in the way that how much 
diversity is is packed into 40 minutes and and i love that thank you well it's been lovely talking to you as well oh i love it so much when we get to do a real deep dive into the thought process behind the album that artists put out it's really cool to hear what motivated and inspired them tim boness i want to thank you very much sir for your time and talking to me it was great lovely conversations i really enjoy it hope you're still safe out there in the uk and not getting flooded up on that hill of yours take care but i wish you the best of luck with the album once again powder dry folks is out now you can buy it wherever you want to buy stuff but there's some really cool vinyl editions and such that you might want to check out like very very cool looking stuff if you're into the vinyl collecting so i wish you the best of luck with the album and hopefully any touring you end up doing tim but the fact that you're working on another one and another projects already is very exciting for those of us that enjoy your work so thank you again sir best wishes to you Thank you to everyone for watching and listening. I do appreciate your time joining me on this little journey. It's always nice to have you along for the ride. If you could hit a like and subscribe, that will be wonderful. Check out the social media links and the link to The Expanse in the description below. I'm going to have a link where you can purchase Tim's album as well. Other than that, this is all I've got for you right now. Just reminding you, never be afraid to deviate from the norm. Keep it proggy. And this is Super Dave, signing off. <laughs>